Please join me in giving our fellow Pachyderm Club member, Ben Seymour, a warm Pachyderm Club welcome. Well, I want to thank everybody for, uh, for attending today, and especially I want to thank Carl Peterjohn for uh, 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 inviting me and giving me an opportunity to speak about my mother's memoir, uh, Fake Son, Real Daughter. Uh, basically, uh, uh, my presentation is only going to be probably be fairly short, uh, 15 minutes or so, and uh, I'm going to uh, uh, read an introduction uh, that I've drafted and also read uh, Chapter 1, Run for Your Life, from her book, and then we'll have a PowerPoint slideshow. Uh, with some very interesting photos that from the early 50s. Um, and they were probably taken by uh, um, either the French military or um, could have been some uh, the American, uh, what was the, before the CIA, the operatives over there, because it was, uh, it, it was very, very interesting. A, a detective story, you know, it, it takes some more sleuthing. And then we'll have a Q&A. Um, anyway, so here, uh, hello, my name is Ben Seymour. I want to thank uh, everybody for coming. Uh, this is uh, this book, uh, Fake Son, Real Daughter, right here, and it's over on the book, uh, on the table there. This is the story of my mother. Uh, her Chinese name is pronounced Zhang Qian. I'll get a little, a little closer here. Her nickname, uh, or milk name, was Zhu uh, Hua Zhang. Uh, in English, that means chrysanthemum. And that was a common practice to name your kids after flowers, the girls. Uh, she was born in Lunan City, the county city, seat of Lunan County, Yunnan Province. This is in southwest China. The area is famous for the stone forest and uh, going back to the, the dynastic times in China. She would uh, later be known as Sophie. Uh, this name was given to her by the French medical personnel who cared for the Chinese nationalist Guomindang war refugees who streamed over uh, the Red River from Yunnan Province as they fled uh, the, the communist oppressors. My mother's story is like that of a planet rotating around the central axis of God's love, light, and sovereignty. The story of God's providential care began in the 1880s when a French Jesuit priest was called by God to go on a mission to China. This priest went to Yunnan province and brought my mother's grandmother to Christ. Without the influence of these missionaries who introduced God to my great-grandmother, my mother would not have come to know Christ. And this is uh, critical to her story because it um, allowed her to keep fighting. I feel dip, deeply emotional when I think of all the struggles, of all the years of struggle my mother endured. Like Maria von Trapp from The Sound of Music, one of my mother's favorite movie characters, my mother had to climb every mountain to seek freedom from communism, make her life in Taiwan, and to meet a godly man. She would be grateful to know that her grandchildren were being raised to understand the depth of pain and co that communism ha has and continues to cause. In the 70s, my mother began writing her life story. This was her life work for the last 15 years of her life, and she entrusted it to me when she passed away in 2014. My mom poured her hopes and love and aspirations into this book. Her dreams are now being realized as we complete and publish her book. As we present this exquisite, this exquisite story of my mother's suffering, quest for love and ultimate triumph, I invite you to keep in mind this, this poem my mother wrote, inspired by the Chinese characters, which combines precious stone, ear, mind, eye, endurance and heart. And the poem goes, with your ear may you hear each word as something very precious. With your mind may you humbly search to understand. With your eye may you note the nonverbal message. With your heart may you listen with real love. And may, you, and may your hearing, understanding, and loving be lasting as enduring as a precious stone. Listen with your ear, understand with your mind, soak it in with your heart. And may her message to be, you be as enduring as a precious stone. She lived faithfully, and most importantly, she persevered. Like my, my, like my mother, may you fight, fight, fight. Keep going and never give up. Uh, signed by me, Benjamin Seymour, July of, tw of this year, 2024. <clears throat> and I'll just read this first chapter. And the, uh, my mother had a, some ba more background. She, uh, she was, uh, um, my mother was the second born in our family, and uh, the third and fourth born were both males. And, my gr and they both died shortly after birth or within less than a year of, of, of life. So my grandmother thought that my, uh, my mother was bad luck, or like you know, her star was too strong. And, uh, and, and it was my mother's fault that the, that the following two uh, children died, you know, shortly. So uh, she was not loved by my grandmother, and so she, my mother stayed with 
um, uh, her aunt, uh, whose husband was a Guomindang uh, colonel in the, in the KMT. And um, so in April of 1950, um, the communists uh, took power in Beijing in, in, in 49, late 49. And it took that much time for them to get down to Kunming because it was just, you know, uh, no highways at that time. It was just very rough. And uh, my mother was staying uh, with her aunt in April of 1950. And the governor of uh, Yunnan at the time was, it was KMT. He was told he had to change and support the communists or, or he would be killed. His wife would be killed and both sides of their families would be killed. So he at midnight swore allegiance to the Chinese communists. And, and at that point, the nationalists had to leave in the middle of the night, and they all gathered their belongings and uh, basically uh, um, just basically ran for their lives toward Finch Indochina China at the time. The French um, uh, would be in control for another four years, and they, ba they basically left with the, the clothes on their backs and what they could carry and you know, horses and stuff. So here's the, the first chapter. Uh, and. Um, Introduction. It was 1950 uh, years after Jesus of Judea and 39 years after the Republic of China was founded. It was the winter season. The long war against Japan, World War II, was finally over. But instead of peace, people craved the truce. The truce brought a huge conflict of war and torn China. The Nationalist Party, the ruling Chinese government, was corrupt and inept. In this political climate, the Communist Party had built its increasing power in North China using captured equipment. The U.S. made an effort to restore peace, but they failed to bring these two warring parties together into one government for the Chinese people. So the nation gave its farewell, to, uh, farewell of, quote, a plague on both your houses and quickly withdrew its troops and financial aid from Chinese soil, referring to the, to the American forces there. The United States was gone, and we were completely forgotten. The torturous war went on with the communists always gaining ground, one province after another. The capital of the nationalist government had to move quickly from one place to another. The Nationalist headquarters moved from Shanghai up the Yangtze River to Nanjing, then to Wuhan, and finally to Kunming, where our family's from. As a last resort, it moved to Taiwan, an island southeast of mainland China, where it remotely operated its duties of administering the affairs and military matters of the handful of provinces left from its formerly vast domain. The Nationalist government didn't rule well while it was here, and it sure rules worse when it is gone, people grumbled. The war went on, the surviving people suffered tremendously, not only from the war and all its demands and destruction, but also from the fellow Chinese, from our fellow Chinese. Men trained in the school of war can never be quite the same as those who were trained in the normal pursuit of peace. Many had quite forgotten how to show kindness. The young and strong did whatever they wanted to do, and people felt abandoned by the government and by the gods. Quote, the gods are too high above, and the emperors too far away, they said, for a famous quote. How many acts of cruelty and inhumanity were performed unintentionally and unintended simply because of men's need for discipline, for higher authority, for the strength of only a superior being could provide for them to bear the heavy burdens demanded by the hardships of war? This is the introduction. Uh, and I'll read real quickly from chapter one. Uh, this is Run for Your Life. This is my mother speaking. I was lying alone on a jagged rock in a valley. The waters of the Red River roared beside me as the stars shone high above me. The rocks where I was trying to sleep were so sharp, so cutting. I tried to find a smoother rock, groping around with my hands, but all the rocks I touched felt sharp and at last my fingers refused to touch anymore. Reluctantly, I lay still on my hurting back as the night wind rushed, as the night wind rushed past. My arms and legs felt sticky and taut. They must have been bleeding. The blood must be drying. The pain rushed through me, but I was afraid to cry. Earlier that day, when, we, when I'd been pricked by thorns and had cried out loud, I'd been hushed by the low, angry voices of other military families who were escaping from the communist coup. Do you wish to die, they said? Are you crying for your own death? I'd instantly held my breath and swallowed down my sobs in a hurry. Now this rock was hurting my back, but I dared not cry. I uh, dared not cry. As I lay there, the wind continued to blow. With the wind came a strong, smothering, sweet smell of flowers all around me. I didn't know how these flowers, flowers looked or what their faces were like, but I knew their thorns had pricked me many times, too many to count. And I could remember the haunting words of my beloved grandmother. There around the Red River, the earth is as hard as bone, its breath venomous, so nothing can grow there but thorns and flowers of thorns. After drinking the red, muddy water from the river, the flowers bloom a dreadful, bloody color. 
The flower's scent is a heavy poison, even more poisonous than opium. Men are afraid to pass this place, for they fear that they will be poisoned by the scent. I shivered. My mind flew back to the events of this dreadful day, the day I ended up on the banks of the Red River, alone at night. It was hard to believe that only this afternoon that my aunt stopped our horse halfway down the mountain and bade me get off. She dismounted as well as her soldier valet, dragged the, court, the cushion from the horse's back and laid it under a thorn bush for her to sit on. He covered the bush with a blanket. There my third aunt could hide in peace while smoking opium. You follow the river and go down to the foot of the mountain to the Red River, she told me. I will catch up to you there. Wait for me by the big bridge, she said. We had been traveling with other military families and soldiers for several days, running from the communists. I had often heard our traveling companions talking about crossing the Red River. Now hearing my aunt speak of the river, I knew we must be close. I didn't think twice about my third aunt's command. There was no way I could know that I would never see her again. Instead, I walked along with the other military families as my aunt had instructed, looking back now and then to see if my aunt was coming yet. I would rather ride with my aunt on the horse than continue to walk, I thought. But without a word, I obeyed my third aunt as I had become accustomed to doing since childhood. As soon as I had learned to walk, my childless third aunt had borrowed me from my mother and brought me to live with her. According to superstition, my presence would end her childlessness. It is a great sin toward our ancestors not to have any offspring, my aunt had said. If I have no child, there will be no one to continue the worship of our ancestors. It is a curse. But my aunt also believed in a powerful superstition that would bring her relief. She believed in inviting me to live with her would entice her to have a baby of her own, and my presence would bring forth her heart's desire. I enjoyed being with my aunt because I knew my mother did not love me. Like all traditional Chinese families, my parents wanted sons. Sons were valued because they could take care of their parents in their old age, so my family wanted nothing but sons. My parents accepted the birth of my elder sister since she was the firstborn, but by the time my mother was pregnant with me, they spared no pains in trying to induce the birth of a son. Every delicacy was given to her to eat. Every exertion was removed from her. Every eye was on her stomach, anticipating a son. But to their dreadful sorrow, I was not born a boy. Because I was a girl, I was unloved. I recently listened to the song, Over the Rainbow, which refers to a lovely vision of beauty that the child heard of once in a lullaby. As I listened to the song, as, as I, listened to the song I got tears in my eyes because I never heard a lullaby or saw a smile over my cradle. My mother later gave birth to one son, but he died before he was one. Her second son died at six months old. I remember I was holding my baby brother, and shortly after that, he died. As a result, Mama believed I was the jinx that caused her two sons' death. My star of destiny, quote unquote, was too strong, and I had killed her two sons. As a result, she barely tolerated my existence. Throughout my young life, I tried very hard to please her. When I failed, I spent much of the t as much time as I could near my beloved grandmother and try to stay away from my mother. I was very grateful that my aunt wanted me in her home most of the time. She rescued me from neglect, the cold shoulder, and my mother's slapping hands. Finally, I had a break. But the superstition didn't work and my aunt remained childless. This filled her with even more pain and shame since my aunt never came near to getting pregnant all the time I was her unofficial baby lurer, L-U-R-E-R, baby lurer, lurer, can I say that? My dad wanted me to come home, so I returned home and attended school with my elder sister, only staying with my aunt during school holidays. I was disappointed about this change, but I treasured the time I spent with my third aunt. I had left my mother's home in Lunan just before Chinese New Year. My uncle, a military colonel, was leaving for a temporary duty assignment at Hainan Island off the Ch South China Sea. Sorry. So my aunt wanted me to keep her company while he was gone. The Chinese government was embroiled in a civil war and the nationalists had fled the communists and moved to Taiwan. And Hainan Island, Taiwan and Hainan Island were the only places still controlled by the traditional Chinese government, the Kuomintang. Just before my uncle arrived to pick me up, my mother arrived home from the capital. She had taken a train to the capital to get a new permanent in her hair, getting ready to celebrate the coming of the new year. The electric curling iron had recently been invented, and some people tried to be modern and put curls in their hair. They risked their own safety by going through electrical tricks just to t end up with what the townspeople called a bird's nest on your head. So, mother had gone to the capital. Let me skip ahead here. So, that, that's, a, that's enough, I think, from the, from the first chapter to give you a, a, a flavor of the book. Um, 
Let, let me start the, um, uh, this, this PowerPoint here. So what, what we're looking at here is this is the, um, uh, the, a photo of uh, the French provincial um, staff there. It's a photo of the, of the French provincial uh, government employees with the French nurses. And there's, I think, a U.S. Army gentleman there on the left, and then the, the Guomindang Chinese officials on the right. And this is their um, opening of the camp for the, uh, the, uh, the Chinese nationalist uh, uh, dependents um, in modern-day Vietnam or French Indochina at the time. And I apologize for reading so quickly. It's, it's kind of a limited time here we have. This, the next photo is uh, a photo, I think my mom's in there somewhere, but it's a, it's a group, uh, a lot of, um, there were a lot of young girls, minors that uh, didn't have parents, or their parents died on, on the way of their trip. So they were, if they joined the uh, Guomindang party, they could become party workers and basically um, uh, have food and, and have safety. And that's, that's them s standing around, a, 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 I believe that's a US Willys Jeep in, um, um, I believe this is in Taiwan. And this is a photo uh, kind of jumping ahead in the early 80s. My mother went back to mainland China in 81, and this is some of her family members coming out of a church service. And it's the traditional, it gives you an idea of the tr traditional uh, garb and, and the clothing. Next photo is, um, this just uh, happened. It's a double 10 day in, in Taiwan. It's the uh, uh, um, commemoration of the, it's a national day for Taiwan, the Wu Chang uh, uprising in Wuhan, and that's when uh, the, uh, the nationalist Chinese uh, uh, declared independence from the Qing dynasty government. And it's a big day, a big deal in Taiwan every year. That's uh, myself, my mother in the middle, and my, my stepfather Dwight, um, after my mother returned from um, um, her first trip back in 81 to mainland China. And uh, this is my mother um, in the mid-60s, um, um, taking some time off and um, um, enjoying the, uh, the sights of, uh, of, of Taiwan. There we go. So it's a, Taiwan is as far south as Acapulco, and it's, uh, the mountains there are even, the highest mountain there is even higher than the Mount Fuji in Japan. So it's a, it's a very lush place. A very, very interesting place to go visit. And here's a, the, in, in the Taipei at the time, the, uh, the, one of the major traffic circles, and it's got the, uh, the, the main portrait of uh, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. He was the, the strong man that ruled Taiwan at the time. And here's a photo of my mother, probably one of the best photos uh, I found of her in um, 1965 in Taipei. And that is the, the end of the slideshow there. And I'll take any questions that you guys have about the book and about, about her story. Yeah, there was several groups. There was the, they have like a Polynesian group of, of inhabitants that were like, uh, they have more, they're, they're more related to uh, um, a Hawaiian, they're Polynesian basically there. They don't, and they have no uh, ethnic Han, Chinese blood in them. They don't look Chinese at all. They're darker skin, they have their own culture. And then they have what's called the uh, Ben Shenren, which are uh, Chinese that, that had emigrated from Fujian province, you know, the previous 100, 150 years that have lived there. And um, the, the first group, they stayed in the mountains. And the, and the, the second group, the, uh, the, the Han Chinese, they, they lived on the coast. And they were mainly uh, merchants, you know. And uh, Taiwan at the time was uh, a very big rice growing area. They also had teak wood, a lot of agricultural products, very little. They lure up in mainland China? No, 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 they, uh, no, the, there was no connection. At that time, uh, there was so much chaos in mainland China. They, uh, China was, uh, Taiwan was an afterthought. They were really, they've been separated and there was no real, so all this um, 
propaganda you see coming from the, the Chinese, uh, the CCP, is just that, it's propaganda. They, they, the Taiwan is a separate, really is a separate, has a separate identity, and there's no, you can't point to any, any serious long-term relationship between Taiwan and, and mainland China. There's a rumor out there that, uh, that the Chinese are making inroads with regard to changing the public opinion of some Taiwanese about, you know, reunification, joining back China. How large is that? I think it's, uh, I only trust what I can, uh, there's so much uh, um, um, not truthful information and there's only a very few people that I trust that actually live there that I, I can cooperate because people, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, uh, bad actors out there. So I, I would refer you to John Batchelor's show. John Batchelor, the normal signing, he's excellent. He's a, uh, um, I think he's in his late 70s, but he's a current affairs guru and he has a program on on um, on podcasts you can pick up on just look at search for John Batchelor. He brings on uh, some of these Chinese scholars that are they're in their 70s and 80s and they they will go way way back and they are uh, I uh, um, yeah because there's so much nonsense coming out of mainland China and so anyways. Thank you man. Sure. I know Thank you just spoke briefly about this but what do you think the chances are of Taiwan maintaining their independence from communist China? I think the uh, as long as the U.S. Um, well, I, I think uh, I think um, uh, President Trump has to win on November 5th, and that we need to be ag very aggressively and have and really have uh, military advisors there in Taiwan, to, to and to be absolutely crystal clear that we will you know come to the defense of Taiwan, uh, because I think she is uh, he's uh, destroyed their economy, their property market is is. Uh, is um, non-existent, and so they are. Um, uh, they don't live in a. They don't live in a rational market-based, rules-based world like we do. They. They. It's. It's a. Communism for them is a religion. So things don't have to add up, and things don't have to make sense and be logical there. And it's just the whole thing is just the power. You know, the grip of, on power. So uh, I think we need to go over there with. The, I think with the Japanese and Australians, and the lesser, and then also the Philippines. I think that we finally smell the coffee kind of thing, and, and we, we're over there. Because they, they, he will try something. That it's guaranteed in the next two years he will try something. But I don't know. I have two questions, please. One question is about Taiwan. If China invades Taiwan, do you think the uh, ESA should send the troops to defend uh, Taiwan? I, uh, I think we, are, we already have to be there before. They're, they've thought they have a... They have thousands of people, their military um, strategy people, that, that think about this problem. They've been thinking about this problem for decades. So they have all of this brain power where they're thinking of all these different ways that they can, you know, retake Taiwan. So I think the thing we have to do is, I think, you know, if if we have two battier, uh, U.S. carrier battle groups in the vicinity, and uh, and it's a whole bunch of other things. It's a very complex, you know, situation over there. I think. We'll make, we'll make their, the cost of too high for them to do something stupid. You know. My second question is about Tibet. As far as I know, Tibet is a separate country by itself. But uh, China claims uh, Tibet is a part of uh, China. Do you agree with that? Yeah, uh, no, yeah, Tibet is an independent country just like Taiwan. Um, it's, it just comes down to uh, their thirst for power. Um, I think. I think the, the the Chinese Communist Party they're the modern face of uh, of a Nazism you know and um, uh, fascism because you know they you you know if you're a high visibility person over there your body is, or even not even that but your your physical body is the property of the government you know they I mean it's crazy they have live organ they 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 the secret police will come and and they'll uh, take people at you know at at night and do a blood test and tissue test, and they sell your organs on the free market. It's insane. Can you tell us how your mother, when she came to the United States, where did she come? How did she end up in this area? Yeah, my uh, yes, my, uh, my father was uh, U.S. Air Force, and he worked in the um, kind of like the um, HVAC area for. Um, he was like a uh, master technical sergeant, like you know, 13 stripes, and he uh, 
he handled the um, um, uh, the buildings that they uh, worked on the helicopters for Vietnam. It was the back theater repair operation for the the, the Vietnamese for the Hueys and the, all the different helicopters there. And then he was there for you know a, a three year four year stint. And and when his when his time was up, they sent him here to McConnell to do the same thing. So that's what we ended up here in McConnell in '69. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.